The images of hijacked airliners smashing into the World Trade Center buildings and the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001 were imprinted on the memories of an entire generation of those who were alive to witness them. Literally millions across the world watched live on television as the second plane, United Airlines Flight 175, a Boeing 767, crashed into the South Tower 18 minutes later. After decades of aircraft raining down destruction on terrorist groups and their supporters across the globe, the United States was now itself suffering attacks from the skies. It is no exaggeration to say that the Western world was stunned by the ruthless efficiency in which the attacks were carried out, or that terrorists could even strike from above at all. The traditional view of terrorism in the West involved cars or trucks being loaded with explosives that were detonated near their intended target, or suicide bombers blending in with crowds before detonating bombs they were carrying on their person. However, 9-11 is far from the only story of aviation being utilized by terrorist organizations to achieve their own ideological goals, and worryingly, the skies look set to offer terrorists even more opportunities to wage their campaigns, as drone technology in particular becomes increasingly inexpensive and easy to acquire. In today's episode, we're going to explore the history of terrorist aviation, examine some key incidents where aircraft have served a use for terrorist groups, and look at the potential threats security services may face in the coming decade. This is Terrorist Air Power. Welcome to Wars of the World. Before we proceed onwards, we must first define what we mean when we say terrorist air power. The word terrorism can have many definitions applied to it, and despite efforts by the United Nations before and after 9-11, there still isn't a definitive, universally accepted definition. In 1994, the United Nations General Assembly used the rather broad definition when condemning terrorist acts as criminal acts intended or calculated to provoke a state of terror in the general public. The problem with any definition of terrorism is that it can be interpreted many ways. Arguments could be made that the deliberate bombing of enemy cities by all sides during World War II could be construed as an act of terror perpetrated by governments and their militaries. However, I'm going to elegantly sidestep that talking point, as in the case of this episode, we are not going to be look at government-sanctioned, military-perpetrated terror, but instead violent, militant groups or individuals that have materialized in support of a particular cause, such as Al-Qaeda or the IRA. One final point we should interject before continuing, Wars of the World aims to be as objective as we can in discussing such groups' activities concerning this topic. However, the issue of terrorism is naturally an extraordinarily provocative one. We are sticking strictly to the historical account of the actions these groups have engaged in. So, let us examine a few noteworthy incidents over the last century where aircraft have been put to use by terrorist groups. The concept of terrorist air power is by no means a new one, and one of the earliest cases can be found in the United States. The city of Tulsa in the state of Oklahoma enjoyed a boom period in the years immediately after the end of World War I. This was thanks to the oil industry, and it produced a growing community of wealthy and educated African Americans emerging in the Greenwood District, which became known as Black Wall Street. 
However, tensions between the black and white communities were always high, and after a young black man was accused of assaulting a white teenage girl in an elevator, the city was set for some of the worst race riots in American history. A shootout took place outside the courthouse where the man was being held, in which 10 white men and two black men were killed, and this triggered the Ku Klux Klan to raise a mob to attack the Greenwood District on the morning of May 31st, 1921. Barely an hour into the mob's attack, a group of white private pilots, many of whom had combat experience from the First World War, marched on the Curtis Southwest Field. Curtis Southwest was the United States' first commercial interstate air freight company, and many of the pilots who assembled on that field that day worked for the company. Curtis Southwest was also a dealer for the Curtis Aeroplane and Motor Company, selling demilitarized aircraft, many of which were left over from the war, such as the Curtis JN4 Jenny biplane. At least 12 Jennies, each with two men on board, were prepared by the pilots and ground crews and began flying around 6 a.m. They took off in the direction of the riot. Flying over Greenwood, one of the men in each aircraft took the controls, while the other ignited small balls of rolled up fabric dipped in turpentine, which were then dropped out of the aircraft. Additionally, some of the men carried rifles on board, which were fired indiscriminately into the crowds of black men, women, and children. It was also reported that some of them dropped sticks of TNT as makeshift bombs. Once they had completed their attacks, they flew the short distance back to the airfield, refueled, rearmed, and flew off to attack again. However, the pilots were not immune from the retribution of their intended victims. At least one of those hurling the homemade incendiary weapons out of the aircraft was shot by a sharpshooter on a rooftop. He fell from the speeding aircraft onto the burning streets below. It would not be until the next day that the Oklahoma National Guard restored order, but by then many people lay dead or severely injured, and 10,000 African Americans were left homeless as a result of the mob and their air attack targeting homes and businesses. This act of terror marked the first time in history an American city suffered under a deliberate air attack. In the late 1960s, Northern Ireland erupted into sectarian violence between the Protestant Unionists, who wished to remain part of the United Kingdom, and the Catholic Republicans, who wanted Northern Ireland to become part of the Republic of Ireland in the South. Denounced by both British and Irish governments, the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, were viewed as criminals and sentenced in special courts. Three high-ranking IRA members, including the IRA Chief of Staff, were being held at Mountjoy Prison, Dublin, in the Republic of Ireland. And their incarceration was disrupting the IRA chain of command. Therefore, a plan was concocted to break them out. On Halloween 1973, at around 3.15 p.m., as a group of prisoners were watching a football match take place in the exercise yard, the air over the prison began to thud with the sound of a helicopter's rotor blades. An aerospatial Alouette II helicopter swoops down and landed in the prison near the inmates. Inmates supporting the breakout quickly turned on the guards, preventing them from interfering, allowing the three terrorists to board the helicopter. The helicopter was flown by Captain Thompson Boys, who had been taken at gunpoint and forced to comply with the IRA's demands by a gunman on board the helicopter with him. With Boys, the gunman, and the three escaped prisoners, the Alouette II helicopter was at maximum capacity, as it flew to a discussed race course in the Baldoyle area of Dublin, where Boys landed. There, the escapees were met by members of the IRA's Dublin Brigade, who released boys unharmed as they ferried the three ex-prisoners to safe houses in the city using a stolen taxi. The daring escape by air made headline news around the world. It would prove an embarrassment to the Irish government while it provided the IRA with a massive propaganda coup. Similar escapes by air were planned for prisons in Northern Ireland, but ultimately they were abandoned due to the heavy British air presence. 
A light helicopter like the Alouette would be easy pickings for the British Army Lynx helicopters, which, as well as being heavily armed with machine guns, were also the fastest helicopters in the world at the time. This hasn't deterred a string of copycats around the world, however. And if anything, escape attempts via helicopter only seem to be increasing in frequency. On June 7th, 2014, three men escaped from prison in Quebec, Canada, while on July 5th, 2018, a French pilot was kidnapped and his family held hostage by a group of men who forced him to assist in another escape attempt. Then in September of this year, 2020, 24-year-old Belgian Mike Gielan took another pilot hostage with a replica handgun, with the aim of breaking his wife, Crystal Appelt, out of Birkendaal Woman's Prison in South Brussels. This attempt ultimately failed. Still, the success of the IRA operation demonstrates the value terrorist groups have found in hijacking aircraft, not only for destructive purposes, but also in the interest of escaping punishment. Between 1976 and 2009, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, or the LTTE, fought a long and bloody conflict with the Sri Lankan government in an effort to establish the independent states of Tamil Elam in the north and east of Sri Lanka. Condemned as a terrorist group by the international community, the LTTE saw itself as a sovereign nation, and much like the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, they established their own shadow government, complete with police forces, education projects, and economy in the land they held control over. As well as their land-based forces known as the Tamil Tigers, they also possessed a crude but effective naval element known as the Sea Tigers. But as the fighting between them and the Sri Lankan government intensified in its final phases, the Tigers took their fight into the skies. On March 26, 2007, alarms sounded at the Sri Lankan Air Force Base north of the capital city of Colombo, where the country's fleet of aircraft were based. The base's defenders were expecting mortars to start raining down, or insurgents attempting to penetrate the outer barrier, so it must have come as an incredible shock when the air filled with the sound of light aero engines, followed by explosions within their own perimeter. Tamil's Air Tigers had just had their baptism of fire. The Tamil Tigers had been at the mercy of the Sri Lankan jets in the recent fighting, and the choosing of the base as a target not only had the potential of limiting the Air Force's ability to bomb Tamil positions, but would also send their morale soaring, while simultaneously sending a message to the Sri Lankan government that the sky was no longer their sole domain. Following the attack, newspapers around the world declared that the LTTE now possessed the first terrorist air force complete with ground attack aircraft. These took the form of Czech manufactured Zlin Z143s that had been discreetly imported in pieces into the country for the Air Tigers to make use of. The LTTE took these rather innocent looking light aircraft, painted them in camouflage, and modified them to carry crude, light bombs under the fuselage. The Air Tigers conducted several more successful attacks following their first, killing six Sri Lankan soldiers in a bunker at Palali, followed by an attack on a Shell oil storage facility just outside the capital, in which nearly $700,000 worth of damage was inflicted. Worse still for the Sri Lankan Air Force, they appeared completely unable to combat the Air Tigers, who flew low and slow and under the cover of darkness. The Sri Lankan Air Force possessed supersonic jets, but they were ground attack oriented because until the emergence of the Air Tigers, they didn't have an air threat and were so not trained to conduct interceptions at night. An attempt to chase down one of the low-flying planes with a helicopter gunship ended rather unceremoniously, when the helicopter suffered an engine failure and crashed. The Sri Lankan Air Force tried desperately to downplay the threat posed by the Air Tigers, but it was clear to everyone that they were capable of inflicting serious damage on Sri Lankan forces. Therefore, in order to meet this new threat, the Sri Lankan Air Force instigated a rapid re-equipment program 
that included radar and air-to-air missiles being fitted to more powerful helicopters, and the acquisition of Chengdu F-7G interceptor planes. Sri Lankan pilots had to quickly retrain for the fighter role in order to hunt down the air tigers who were getting bolder in their attacks, including providing close, direct air support for their ground forces waging their guerrilla campaign against Sri Lankan government troops. While they waited for the new aircraft and weapons to become operational, the Sri Lankan Air Force conducted a bombing campaign against possible airstrips the air tigers could use for their aircraft. But the problem was that the little Zlin Z143 was designed to be able to fly from the most rudimentary of airstrips, and so could be flown from almost any flat clearing. Over a year after their first attack, things started to take a turn against the Air Tigers when on September 9th, 2008, they lost an aircraft in an air-to-missile fired by a Sri Lankan F-7. By 2009, the situation for the LTTE as a whole was becoming dire, as the Sri Lankan forces began to overwhelm them. It was also becoming increasingly difficult for the Air Tigers to operate effectively in the face of a Sri Lankan Air Force that was now baying for their blood. Then on February 20th, 2009, the Air Tigers launched their final airstrike, and it was clear those involved had no intention of coming back alive. The target was, perhaps fittingly enough, the Sri Lankan Air Force headquarters in Colombo, as well as a final attack on the base where it all had began. Both of the planes involved failed to make it to their targets. The aircraft heading for the Air Force headquarters was hit by anti-aircraft fire and crashed into the Inland Revenue Department building opposite the Sri Lankan Air Force headquarters, starting a fire which spread to an adjacent hotel before it was brought under control. The second Z143 was also shot down by anti-aircraft fire, crashing just short of its target, relatively intact. Inspecting the crash site, Sri Lankan authorities found the body of the pilot and the plane packed with explosives, indicating that the two pilots that day had intended to crash into their targets, effectively acting as makeshift guided missiles. On May 18th, 2009, the Sri Lankan authorities declared final victory over the LTTE. It would be easy to dismiss the Air Tigers as being relatively insignificant in their ultimately doomed bid for independence, especially when compared to their more effective terrorist bombings and guerrilla campaign against the Sri Lankan army. However, psychologically, they had a massive impact on the Sri Lankan people, their government and militaries the world over, who had to recognize the danger of poorly equipped but resourceful and committed combatants in light aircraft. The Air Tigers also had a major impact on the Sri Lankan economy, as foreign airlines and businesses began to refuse to operate from some of the country's airports that shared runways with the Sri Lankan Air Force, in case they got caught up in an air strike. Born during the 1982 Lebanon War, in which Israeli forces invaded the country in an effort to destroy militant groups who had attacked Jewish settlements along the border, Hezbollah, supported by Iran, became a major force for Shia Muslims in Lebanon throughout the 1980s. As well as combating rival factions for control of Lebanon during the country's civil war, Hezbollah was also responsible for increasingly sophisticated and deadly attacks on Israeli and Western targets. As well as regional operations, they also carried out a number of international attacks, such as the bombing of the Israeli embassy in Argentina, 1992. And these were often coordinated with and supported by Iran. Iran itself had been using drones for reconnaissance purposes since the early 1980s, when they saw extensive use in the Iraq-Iran war that dominated the Persian Gulf for the better part of the decade. As such, by the turn of the century, they had developed numerous drone types, which began to be filtered down to Hezbollah for use against Israel. Unlike the Air Tigers of Sri Lanka, however, who were initially facing an opponent poorly prepared to face an air threat, Hezbollah drone operators were facing probably the most densely defended airspace on Earth. Hezbollah received and deployed small Mursad-1 drones from Iran, which had a relatively low radar cross-section, 
and could fly at very low levels, where terrain often masked them from detection, making them elusive targets for the Israeli Air Force. Hezbollah began receiving equipment and training for drone operations in 2002, and on November 7, 2004, they conducted their first drone incursion into Israeli airspace. The drone conducted a 20-minute reconnaissance over the town of Nahariya in Western Galilee, before evading interception by the Israeli Air Force and returning to Lebanon. Encouraged by this success, Hezbollah conducted another reconnaissance flight in April the following year, and again, the Israelis were unable to stop it before it returned to Lebanon. Hezbollah now believed they had a powerful new weapon in their hands with which to continue their campaign against Israel, and boasted that their Mursad drones could reach deep into Israel and carry out surgical strikes with 50 kg or 110 pound bombs. Following a major raid into Israel by Hezbollah in 2006, Israeli forces retaliated by initiating a 34-day military campaign into Lebanon. As part of Hezbollah's defense, they armed three Iranian-manufactured Ababil drones with 50 kg bombs to attack Israeli targets. However, in this instance, the Israelis were able to locate, track, and destroy the drones using F-16 fighter planes before they could inflict any damage. The shooting down of the Ababils prompted a halt to the Hezbollah drone operations over Israel. They would not restart again for some six years, when on October 6th, 2012, Hezbollah conducted an operation named Hussein Ayyub, which saw a drone fly within sight of Israel's nuclear facility at Dimona. The Israeli Air Force managed to destroy the drone, but not before it beamed images of the complex back to its Lebanese operators, who then shared them with their Iranian backers. It has since been speculated the operation was conceived of by Iran, who wanted to send a message to Israel that the facility was vulnerable to attack should Israel attempt to interfere militarily with Iran's own nuclear program. At the time, there was much speculation that the drone used was an advanced type, possibly copied from US drones captured operating in Iranian airspace. However, this has been denied by Tehran. A few months later in December 2012, however, a US Scan Eagle drone was captured by Iran and copied in the form of the Yasir drone. While not confirmed, it's been speculated that Hezbollah have used this drone against Israel and even its political rivals. While Israel remains Hezbollah's primary focus since the outbreak of the Syrian civil war in 2012, much of their drone operations have shifted to supporting Syrian President Bashir al-Assad, against rebel factions and the Islamic State. However, given the improvement in Israeli defenses in recent years, with the development of weapons such as the Iron Dome surface-to-air missile system, which can literally engage artillery shells, it's doubtful that Lebanese drones will be as effective again as they initially were against the Jewish state. The origins of the Al-Qaeda organization can be traced back to 1988, in the Peshawar region of Pakistan that borders Afghanistan, which at the time was in the grips of a brutal and bloody war between the Soviet Union and its allies in the Afghan government and the many Afghan tribes who viewed the cultural changes made under communism as being against Islam. Al-Qaeda operated against the Soviets and so received funding and support from the CIA, who viewed the conflict as another chapter in the Cold War. However, once the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, many of Al-Qaeda's fighters wanted to join the fight in support of other Islamist struggles, and through the 90s, Al-Qaeda became a global terrorist force under its leader, Osama bin Laden. After a period of brutal wars against some of the factions in Afghanistan, the Taliban came to power supported by Al-Qaeda, who saw the country as a refuge and a training ground for its fighters. After their attacks on 9-11, Afghanistan was invaded by a US-led multinational force who toppled the Taliban, but both organizations still exist to this day. Given the extremely secretive nature of the Al-Qaeda organization and the degree of public hysteria regarding terrorism and aircraft after 9-11, it's difficult to piece together the whole picture of Al-Qaeda's air capabilities. In the immediate months after the attacks in New York, numerous theories emerged about the organization using commercially available flight simulation software to plan the attacks. 
There were also reports of Al-Qaeda trying to acquire crop spraying aircraft to spread deadly chemical or biological agents over population centers in the US, before settling on the hijackings, which they argued would have a greater impact on the American psyche. One of the key reasons that Al-Qaeda have managed to survive even the death of Bin Laden is that the group is widespread and combines many factions. It is in one of these factions that the origins of the Islamic State group can be traced back to 1999. The faction's operations soon centered around combating American and coalition troops in Iraq, and in 2014, it declared itself a worldwide caliphate, referring to itself as the Islamic State, and declaring that it had authority over Muslims worldwide. Taking advantage of the chaos in Syria and Iraq, the group seized a large area of land in western Iraq and eastern Syria, imposing its ideology and brutality upon all the people there. As terrorist organizations go, Islamic State set a new standard. Making widespread use of social media to broadcast their propaganda and their atrocities, they continue to inspire disenfranchised Muslims in Western countries to commit violent acts against civilians and spread terror in Western countries. This hysteria, in turn, may be partially responsible for other terrorist attacks by lone wolves in Western countries on mosques and Muslim communities, furthering the cycle of violence and innocent bloodshed. Also, while certainly not the first terrorist group to do so, IS actively seized territory and held onto it, with even the US supported Iraq seemingly unable to stop them. This helped differentiate them from previous Islamic terrorist groups in the eyes of the Western public, who instead of seeing them as lone wolf soldiers, now saw them as an army of extremely violent fanatics that for a time seemed unstoppable. Western governments and media outlets have tried to combat their influence with footage of drone strikes killing Islamic State fighters with extraordinary efficiency. Now, however, Islamic State fighters have begun to operate their own drones in a similar manner. Initially, the group used off-the-shelf drones pretty much anyone could buy to help in their propaganda campaign by filming sweeping shots of their supporters or giving a bird's eye view of their executions. However, the combat role of these drones was obvious, and soon enough, they began to be used as scouts, allowing their commanders to control attacks on Iraqi and Syrian government targets. In Mosul, for example, these drones were used to coordinate mortar attacks and improve their fighters' aim, while one Islamic State drone filmed the Sky News correspondent Stuart Ramsey and his team's close call when a car bomb exploded in the same streets they had stopped in. It was inevitable that the Islamic State would weaponize their drones, either by fitting them with crude release devices for explosives or simply crashing them into their targets. On January 24th, 2017, Islamic State released a video showing footage of around 19 attacks using modified drones that could be bought in any Western hobby or toy shop. The use of these drones became such a concern for coalition commanders that they began a concerted effort to try and limit their effectiveness, including trying to jam the controlling signal to the drone and even the deployment of drone defender guns, hand portable beam type weapons. However, this has failed to completely stop Islamic State from using drones, who are, even now, manufacturing their own types using plywood in place of the lightweight plastics used on commercial types. Before 2001, an attack such as the one on 9-11 seemed an impossibility. Today, there are a great number of fail-safes in place aimed to prevent such atrocities using airliners from happening again, making the chances of a repeat attack extremely small, although we have to accept that it is not entirely removed. Despite this, it seems that smaller aircraft remain a much greater challenge, and even in the seemingly secure airspace of North America and Europe, they still pose a risk should a terrorist group decide to employ one dropping explosives or simply ramming into their target. Large commercial aircraft are constantly tracked, and the second they go off course, we know something has gone wrong. This isn't the case for small private planes. They can strike almost out of nowhere with no warning. 
But in the 21st century, there are other routes to hijack control of the skies. As planes and the skyways in which they fly grow ever more reliant on computers, there is a growing fear that terrorists will one day be able to hack into air traffic control systems and force an aircraft to crash. This is a threat that air authorities the world over are taking very seriously after the so-called WannaCry ransom attack of 2017, which infected an estimated 300,000 computers worldwide and led to a lockdown of the UK National Health Service computer system. Meanwhile, there are increasing calls for greater regulation of drones in countries like the United States and the United Kingdom because of the potential for them to be used in terrorist and criminal activities. However, just how this would limit a terror group's ability to acquire and operate a drone remains debatable. But the threat even primitive drones can present to industrious nations was dramatically revealed in December of 2018, when reports of a drone flying near Gadwick in London caused the airport to shut down for fear of a collision with a passenger jet taking off or landing. While those responsible and their motivations remain unclear, it surely demonstrated to terrorists the ease in which they could use a small drone to disrupt or potentially bring down a passenger jet, and this has led to investment in anti-drone technology to protect airports. Around the world, the increasingly inexpensive drone technology continues to give otherwise primitive groups a powerful weapon against more sophisticated enemies. On September 14th, 2019, Houthi fighters in Yemen dispatched 10 small drones to attack the state-owned Saudi oil field at Abqiq. The drones caused massive damage and cut Saudi oil production in half, representing 5% of the world's oil output at the time. This was an unimaginable level of success for a relatively inexpensive operation. Ultimately, the benefits aviation technology can offer terrorists is balanced by the ability of security forces to counter them. In the age after 9-11, and with terrorists actively seeking to get our attention, the fear of terrorism continues to prompt governments to seek solutions to countering potential terrorist threats. We can only hope that whatever a terrorist might think of, the experts can think of it first and counter in advance with preparation. Whether we succeed or fail, the skies are set to be the next battleground for the future of terrorism. And there you have an account of terrorist air power. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.